everyone. Welcome to our webcast focusing on trauma and suicide. We'll be focusing on systems change and one-on-one -on -one connections. My name is Katie Volk and I'm coming to you from the New England Mental Health Technology Transfer Center Network, MHTTC. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with Caroline and Sarah who will introduce themselves in just a minute. Uh, this is a webcast sponsored by SAMHSA. Um, we focus on New England in particular, but I know we have people from all over the country, which is so heartening to see, and we welcome all of you. Uh, the Mental Health Technology Transfer Network focuses on best practices and evidence-based practices and bringing together community connections um, for their region. Uh, so what I'm going to do is give you a little bit of housekeeping information and then hand it right over to Caroline and Sarah. Um, so your microphones are all muted. There's a lot of participants here, and so we do that to cut down on the background noise. If you have any questions, looks like most of you have found the chat box, so feel free to ask your questions in the chat box, and Caroline and Sarah will monitor that as they're presenting, and we'll try to get to all of your questions um, if we can. The session is being recorded and will be archived on the MHTTC website, usually within about 24 hours of our beginning, uh, our our uh, recording, rather, uh, and so you can look for that there. Um, if you're interested in continuing education credit for today's webcast, you'll get that information via email at the end of this webcast, and then if you have any questions after the session, you can always email us. Our email address is on the screen, and in a minute I'll put it in the chat box. And last but not least, if you're having any technical questions, um, technology issues and things, we can try to help you troubleshoot that. Um, my colleague, uh, Jen Battis, um, will actually be able to type it into the chat box there if you're having any issues. She'll try to troubleshoot with you. Uh, and so without further ado, I am going to hand it over um, to Caroline and Sarah. Thank you so much, Katie. And welcome, everyone. Thanks for spending your afternoon with these important intersecting topics of trauma and suicide. It's interesting. I did a Google search of images for trauma and suicide, and what I got back were flyers from our own organization. Um, what that said to me is even though trauma-informed has become quite a buzzword over the years, that often those approaches, those ideas, don't extend to those people who are suffering the most. Often when trauma-informed is used as a buzzword, sometimes the meaning of trauma is very simplistic and doesn't consider things like collective traumas or social factors. So we hope with this webinar to really do both to make sure we understand what we're all talking about in trauma-informing systems and interactions, and making sure that those good practices don't go out the window when someone is considering ending their life. Uh, before I turn it over to Sarah, to say a little bit about our organization, I want to first acknowledge uh, the traditional custodians of the land that we're on. Indigenous Americans have the highest rate of suicide per capita in this country, Australia, and Canada. So again, as we're exploring trauma, we're going to be looking at the trauma of loss of land, loss of identity, loss of cultural practices and life ways, and how that intersects with the suicide rate and how social justice issues like decolonization are actually a really important part of addressing suicide. So I want to, before we begin, um, acknowledge uh, the Nipmuc, the Pukamtuk, and the Abenaki, all peoples, uh, traditional custodians of the land in the Connecticut River Valley uh, where these slides and ideas were developed. Uh, we want to pay our respects to the Nipmuc, Pakamtuk, and Abenaki, and um, pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. 
Thanks, Caroline. And so my name is Sarah. I'm going to share a little bit about who I am in just a little while, but for now I'm just going to leave it at my name. And I want to talk to you briefly about the Western Mass Recovery Learning Community. We're not going to spend a lot of time here, but we just like to have people have a sense of where we're coming from, where the information that we're sharing is coming from, because we have found that you know, the actual work we're doing on the ground with people drives so much of what we bring to you in these learning environments. So I am not a big fan of reading to people when they can see for themselves very often, but I am going to read our mission statement, which is the slide, uh, if you're able to see it there before you, and you can just read along. So the Western Mass RLC supports healing and empowerment for our broader communities and people who have been impacted by psychiatric diagnosis, trauma, extreme states, homelessness, problems with substances, and other life-interrupting challenges through peer-to-peer -peer support and genuine human relationships, alternative healing practices, learning opportunities, and advocacy. Essential to our work is recognizing and undoing systemic injustices such as racism, sexism, ableism, transphobia, transmisogyny, and psychiatric oppression. Now, in our longer training, I'd spend more time unpacking for you how our mission statement has changed over time. But I will just say this is not where we started 13 years ago. It's really broadened. And one of the ways that it's broadened is to include that piece at the end that talks about systemic oppression. And that is really going to link, you're going to see when we get to it a little bit later, with this idea of trauma and suicide. So many people in our community and in the world have been impacted by these sorts of injustices, and it's driven them to consider whether or not this world can really meet their needs. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Thanks, Sarah. I'm not sure how many folks were able to join us a couple weeks ago for the Alternative to Suicide Overview. We hope if you didn't get a chance to join us in person, that you will take the opportunity to check out that recording. Alternatives to suicide is the approach we use in the Western Mass recovery learning community. And we are starting to extend um, what began as you know, some of the first true peer-to-peer -peer support groups around suicide in the world, extend some of those lessons over the past dozen years uh, to creating trainings for people in various roles, providers, family members, clergy. So ultimately, when we are talking about this shift toward uh, awareness of trauma, what it really means is an awareness of story. It's an awareness of the context of people's lives. So moving away from diagnostic codes that are intended to bill insurance for large numbers of people. We're moving away from that defining people and really taking the time to understand the unique uh, pain, losses, unfulfilled needs, but also the strengths and the points of light in a person's life. Trauma-informing our response to suicide also means grounding our response in healing community. Um, instead of assuming that an institutional setting is automatically the one for someone who's having thoughts of suicide. And ultimately, because so much of people's trauma is connected to a loss of control in their life, we are shifting away from taking power over people, controlling people, to focusing on building a human connection. So speaking of story, <laughs> I don't have enough time here to share with you what I would ordinarily share in a training, but I am going to spend a little bit of time sharing some of my experience with you, and you'll see hopefully how it ties in with what we're going to talk about. So often I start my stories by talking about these little snapshots, these moments in time, because it's a way for me to share some broader information without getting into the details. And the first snapshot I often share with people is that of me clinging to my father's leg and begging him not to go, because he's come and he's gone, he's come and he's gone, and he's about to leave for the last time. And I'm about two, three maybe at the most. 
And then this next snapshot is of me playing with a neighborhood boy that my family thought it was safe to leave me alone with, and it ended up not being. And then I had this really vivid snapshot of me standing at the front of my childhood home with my hand on this cold pane of glass, looking out the window at the driveway, and I'm crying because I'm watching my mother drive away, and she's leaving me alone with my infant brother. And I'm scared. And then these snapshots start going faster and faster, and now I am in middle school, and I'm pretending to talk on the payphone and hide in the bathroom because I have no one to sit with at lunch, and I'm around 10. And now I'm being hit awake, and I don't know why, in the middle of the night, and I'm about 12. And then I'm 15, and not surprisingly, things are not going so well for me, not at home, not at school. I'm skipping a lot of school. Things are a lot of fighting at home and my mother decides that she needs to get me in line and her best idea is to call an educational consultant. Now I want to say this is a turning point for me that I always name no matter what version of my story I'm sharing. And the turning point is based on privilege. I'm white and I grew up in Greenwich, Connecticut. For those of you from the area, it means I grew up around money. And had I not had access to that kind of privilege, I very likely would have ended up either in the foster care system or the mental health system at this point. But I did have that privilege, and so instead my mother called this educational consultant. And what is an educational consultant? Basically someone who you pay a lot of money to who has a lot of connections. And my mom wanted her to get me to a boarding school that would straighten me out in her version of what that meant. And instead, this educational consultant suggested this early college. So that got my attention. I was willing to consider that. And that meant that 11 days after I turned 16, I found myself in Great Barrington, Massachusetts at Simon's Rock College. And I was so excited because I was out of my house and on my own for the first time. And I was also so terrified that I was shaking because I was on my own and out of my house for the first time. And it was hard. This also started a cycle for me of running and hiding, running and hiding. This was my first run, and I was convinced that it was going to basically fix everything. The problem is that I came with me, and so it was still hard. And it went okay for a while, and then I really retreated again into hiding mode. And, you know, at some point, it just became clear I was not going to keep passing classes and doing okay, so I pulled on those educational consultant strings again, and I said, hey, educational consultant, I know it's way past all the deadlines for transfer to any other school, but could you help me with your connections? And she did. And so I transferred to another college in Worcester, Massachusetts. And I'm glad that I left when I did because shortly after I left, this, this guy that I'd gotten to know quite well, boy really, his name was Wayne, and we'd become quite close, and I'd learn all sorts of things about him, like his favorite song was Lady in Red, and he used to go on these... Uh, we used to go on these long drives together where he shared with me that he'd had a crush back at home on this girl who played first violin. He played third violin in the school and all this stuff. And then we drifted, and then I transferred. And right after I transferred, he picked up a gun, and he ended up going around that college campus and shooting and killing multiple people, including a student who was in my entering class of 27 kids. And I know that's a lot to share with you here. I share it because it taught me something really important that shifted my life in that time. And what he taught me was that I already knew I couldn't trust the people in my life who'd been chosen for me, that they weren't safe. What he taught me is I also couldn't trust the people I was choosing for me. So the world just caught really, really, really unsafe for me. There was no way I thought it was okay for me to be in it. And I had already been thinking periodically about suicide based on some of the things I experienced at home, and this really put me in that place pretty heavily. And, you know, there's lots else that I could tell you that happened at that point. I started intersecting with the mental health system. They told me things like I have a chemical imbalance. They didn't ask me any questions about what really had happened to me. But I didn't know better. I was happy for the answers they were giving me. The problem is that the answers weren't leading to something better. And after another run where I found myself in Florida and talking to yet another therapist, I also started having in, you know, experiences where people were wanting to put me in the hospital. So this led to my first hospitalization against my will. And I say against my will, others would say voluntary. My record says voluntary because they said things to me like, you have a choice. Either you go voluntarily or if you refuse to go voluntarily, we will force you. 
was really notable though is that they put me there because I was self-injuring a lot and that scared them, cutting and burning, things like that. And nobody when I was there asked me, why are you doing these things? And I could have told them, I could have told them things like sometimes I feel so far out of my body that when I burn myself, it helps ground me. And sometimes when I'm so overwhelmed by this pain in this world that I can't control, this is a pain I can control, and it provides me with a relief. And maybe most importantly, even though you're afraid that this is a sign that I'm going to kill myself, it's one of the few things that I have figured out to do that helps keep me alive and on this planet. And they took that from me. And really all I learned throughout this whole period was do not trust people, do not talk to them about what's going on. Now I want to take a jump from here because there's something else I really want to tell you about that drives me in my work. And that takes me all the way to where I'm working with the Western Natural Recovery Learning Community. Now, no, there's lots that happened between there. I moved, I ran again basically from where I was in Florida back to Massachusetts. I tried working in the clinical system to try and figure myself out, which I think a lot of people do and they just don't admit it in the clinical system. And eventually I found myself in the Western Mass RLC. And what I learned from being here, where we get to speak openly about what we've been through, is that you can get a lot more done if you don't have to try and keep all these pieces of yourself hidden and separate. So that was really powerful. And at some point, I kind of thought I'd figured things out. I knew things would still sometimes be hard, but I thought I'd really gotten to a point where I knew I could also get through it. And then we hit 2010. And I want to have a second child. Now, I had my first child, my son, in 2003 very unplanned story for another time. Now in 2010, I'm going to plan to have this child. And I really planned, I even planned the month based on when her father was born. And I got pregnant right away, but I had a miscarriage. And then I tried again and I got pregnant right away and I had a second miscarriage. And at that point, I was really a mess. When I got pregnant for the third time in 2011, I was struggling so much with this miscarriage that sometimes I'd feel the baby kick and then I would be convinced the baby had just vanished. And I would run home, drop everything I was working on, run home, just to use this baby heart monitor that I'd rented off online to make sure that the baby was still there. And I also got myself kicked out of an OBGYN because I am a bad patient on a good day and this was not a good day. And I was pestering them to give me ultrasounds to prove the baby was still there and they thought I was too much. So I ended up with this other OBGYN. I tried trusting her. To tell, you know, to tell her what had happened to me, and I thought for sure she'd say, you had a really traumatic year, and what you're going through makes sense. But instead, she asked me if I was taking any psychiatric drugs for that. So I didn't <laughs> talk about it anymore. And I was just convinced that if I could just get to the point where my baby was born and my baby was healthy, everything would be okay. My daughter was born on October 11th, 2011, and she was okay, she was healthy, she was, you know, as happy or not happy as babies can be. And I was not okay still. I started very soon after that having visions that were telling me to hurt her. And in fact, they would tell me to drop her over the railing of this balcony area on the third floor of the building where I work most frequently here in Holyoke, Massachusetts. And I didn't ever feel like I was at risk for doing it, but it was terrifying. I was having nightmares and those were terrifying as well. And I didn't tell anybody. I knew well enough what people think of mothers who have thoughts of, hear voices, see visions telling them to hurt their kids, and I wasn't going to tell anyone. Now, a couple of years into that, it went on for quite a while. A couple of years into that, I was sitting in a group that's similar in spirit to the alternative to suicide groups that we talk here where people are making meaning of their experiences. And I didn't say a word, but I heard other people making meaning of their experiences and somehow I got space in my head to make meaning of mine as well. And what I realized was that those visions were not telling me to hurt my baby, but they were telling me that I still blame my body for the loss of those two other babies. And once they realized that, visions didn't just stop, but they started to lose a lot of their power and then they faded away. Now, fast forward to January of 2019, I took a suicide prevention training in New York State was an assist training, perhaps some of you are familiar. And I did not agree with a lot of what they were saying in the assist training. I took it for research purposes. I wanted to understand how it compared to our alternative to suicide approach. I got to day two and I had to make a choice. In day two, we were supposed to do these role plays to practice the approach that I did not agree with. And I either could walk away or I could use that opportunity to do a role play with my partner in front of the group 
that might push on some of the beliefs that I didn't agree with in the training. I chose the latter because that's who I am. And I shared. I shared. I did role play based on that time when I was struggling with my daughter and those visions because I was also really suicidal during that time, not because I thought I was going to hurt her, but just because it was so much. And I went through it, and I, at the end, I told people it was me. I, I debriefed with them, and I shared, and I told them what, how I'd made meaning of the experience, how I'd moved through it, what hadn't helped, what had helped, how long ago it was, and that I never thought I was at risk for hurting my daughter. And then the training ended. People thanked me. I thought everything was fine. I went home, and two days later, my phone rang. And it was the Department of Children and Families because one of the trainers had called to suggest I was a risk to my daughter. And so I did what a lot of us do when we're mad, because I was certainly mad after I got that phone call. I got on social media and I talked about it. And I tagged the organization that was responsible for the training and for reporting me to the Department of Children and Families. And I talked about how this is why people, instead of reaching out for help, do things like kill themselves. The sort of reaction to not even check in with me, to just report me, to put my family at risk, this is why people feel hopeless about asking for help, even when they're thinking about suicide. Then I went to the gym, which is another way that I move through stress. And as I'm pulling into the gym parking lot, my phone rings again, and this time it's the police. Because that same organization has now called the police to do a wellness check on me and see if I'm really okay or if I'm at risk for suicide, even though my post was so clear that I was talking generally about this philosophical issue of why the system fails us. Now, I share this with you now because that is what the system is often doing in response to people when they talk about suicide, and that is why it's so important that we have these conversations and why other approaches are available and why we can talk about loss of power, loss of control, trauma, and suicide, and how they all interrelate and how we can do something better. Now, I just want to show you, a lot of people, when they hear that, they want to see my daughter. They want to see if she's okay, and she really is okay. These pictures are a little bit old. She's eight now. She was uh, more like five or six in these pictures. It was a, during a cross-country road trip that she, my son, and her dad took 8,700 miles with a 15-year-old and a uh, five-year-old, I think, at the time. And, uh, yeah, so this is South Dakota, New Mexico, et cetera. Anyway, that is where I will leave you with this story. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you for being willing to share that and really bring to light how putting distress into context is so critical and that oftentimes the things that impact us um, deeply are simply not acknowledged in our culture as the traumas that they are, particular um, from your example, um, miscarriages. There is so much silence around that and lack of acknowledgement and support. Um, what Sarah's story is also really important to hear because those of us that are doing this work, we will be encountering folks who, like Sarah, have had re-traumatizing events from the system itself um, that is meant to support. Um, it's so important to be aware of that um, as we're building trusting and authentic relationships, that awareness, so that we don't replicate it, but also in our connections with people, our supportive connections, that we're making room to talk about some of these institutional traumas as well. So we're going to continue with this theme of stories here, stories about um, wider social conditions. I will tell um, some of my story later, but right now um, the story I want to tell um, takes place in Southern California. Um, and it involves a man named Vincent Folletti. Uh, so sometimes people have heard quite a bit about the ACE study, but what a lot of people don't know is that Vincent Folletti was not a psychiatrist, a psychologist, or a social worker. Um, the person who ended up spearheading 
what remains one of the largest studies of trauma um, ever conducted um, was actually a physician at an obesity clinic. His role in supporting others was simply to help them lose weight, folks that had been labeled as clinically obese. And this is what he did day in and day out uh, until one day a woman came for a follow-up appointment. Now, what got Vincent's curiosity for story really uh, ignited was this woman he had supported to lose a great deal of weight, but when she returned for the follow-up, she had gained it all back. Um, and it was in a time period that he had thought was biologically impossible. So it piqued his curiosity, and he actually sat down with this woman and started asking her questions about her life. And what he discovered was that this woman was actually the survivor of horrific incest. Uh, when she had lost all the weight, suddenly people were making comments about her body, um, asking her on date, um, sexual advances, and it brought all of that pain and horror rushing back to her. And so what she did, both to help numb the pain but also as a protective factor, was to eat. And so Vincent was curious. He thought, how many people am I supporting here uh, with the goal of losing weight, uh, having obesity defined as their problem, but that are really dealing with these much deeper issues of trauma and adversity that would be super important to address and heal probably first, um, more important. And so he went to a conference of people in his discipline, other uh, obesity physicians, and he presented this theory that many of the folks that they were supporting um, were actually survivors of childhood trauma and that that was impacting um, things like body mass and eating habits. Well, basically, at the conference, he was sort of lapped out of the room. His colleagues said to him really dismissive things, like, oh, Vincent, those people, they just need to follow their diet and exercise plans. What are you talking about, this trauma thing? I think most of these people are unmotivated or lazy. And the way that he was treated and the way he heard people talked about actually motivated him to go back and do the largest uh, trauma study um, of, of its kind at that time. And so for those that are unfamiliar, what the study that Vincent designed was fairly simple. He didn't simply uh, ask people have you, did you have a traumatic childhood? Because a lot of people would likely say, oh, you know, it wasn't that bad. There were people that had it worse. Uh, instead, he offered a simple 10-point questionnaire, um, each with yes or no questions. Uh, you can see five of those questions on the slide. Before your 18th birthday, was your mother often pushed or grabbed? Uh, before your 18th birthday, was a biological parent ever lost to you through divorce, abandonment, or another reason? Another question not on the slide, before your 18th birthday, did someone five years or more older than you touch you in a sexual way? And it's out of this 10-point questionnaire that people come up with what's called the ACE score. So an A score is always a number between 0 and 10, and it simply refers to how many of the questions you answered yes to. 
Uh, Vincent, because he worked for Kaiser Permanente, had access to the medical records of thousands and thousands of people um, to check against the responses in the survey and was able to look at a whole slew of different variables. And what he found was staggering. So Vincent was absolutely right in his hypothesis. People with greater childhood adversity absolutely um, tend to have a higher BMI, um, but there's other physical effects to trauma as well. As ACEs increase, so did risk of heart disease, lung cancer, arthritis, and other autoimmune conditions. Um, ACE, having a higher ACE score, it was correlated with a lower lifetime income and increased contact with the criminal justice system. And um, most importantly, for the purposes of this webinar, an ACE score of four made someone 1,200% more likely to have a suicide attempt than someone with an ACE score of zero. Uh, when the ACE score um, was increased to six or more, that likelihood increased by 5,000%. So this study, just for historical reference, came around the time that people were getting super excited about genetic studies, um, biological studies, chemical imbalance theory was still super hot to trot. And um, what we see, though, is in that realm of research, genetics, brain structural and chemical difference, you don't see anything like these numbers. Clearly, trauma had this staggering effect. Um, but, you know, I think it's something for all of us to explore and grapple with why a lot of this information was sort of buried or not considered. And people continued to, uh, you know, make hypotheses and structure systems around the idea that suicide is related to something congenital or some kind of like biological condition in the brain that folks are born with. Sorry. So one of the ideas that we just want to start to get at with you is that suicide in a lot of systems are, is considered the problem, the thing to stop or, or get rid of. What we want to offer is that, in many ways, suicide is the solution. It is what is most visible, so people focus on it, but it's the solution. Now, saying it's the solution doesn't mean that we think it's a good solution or it's a desirable solution and the one that we want to support, but it is people's attempt to, to address some underlying problems that are often harder to see. One of the things that really problematic about focusing on suicide and frankly the same with, with self-injury and a number of other struggles. If you focus on that as if it's just, if, as if the goal is to just make it go away, if we can just get this person to stop being suicidal or stop, you know, whatever it is we're focused on, then we miss what's actually going on underneath that. So you can hear, see there that this image is, you know, suggesting so many things that just are a little bit out of sight that might be driving this attempt to, to look for a solution like housing struggles. We see a lot of people who are living on the street who are considering, you know, not staying in this world with us, shame, she's around gender roles or, or being alienated from family because of having come out as being queer or, or trans or, you know, any number of other things that a family might not approve of. Sexual abuse history, debt is a big one. We'll talk more about some of these a little bit later. But the main point is that when we see suicide as the sole problem to be fixed, we, we can really miss a lot of this. Now, one of the things that ACE doesn't get at that still relates to trauma is, is everything that can happen to us beyond childhood <laughs> that is important to consider and that can influence people's sense of their place in the world. And one of those things is, you know, really, of course, the violence that's experienced in war. I don't think that'll surprise anyone, but veterans are 42% more likely 
to have a suicide attempt than others. We also see on the slide other information like people who've been raped are four times more likely to think about suicide than those who haven't been. And also one of the things that's on here that I think is really interesting around being bullied is that it's not just the person who's being bullied, but also the people who are witnessing or engaging in bullying behavior that actually have increases in suicide risk. These are some of the other pieces of, of trauma that aren't so well represented in the ACE study. Another piece that is not represented well in the ACE study is around systemic oppression, that piece that I said we would come back to from our mission statement. So this is just a sampling you'll see on the slide of different statistics related to suicide and systemic oppression. But it's really important to remember that systemic oppression, of course, equates to trauma for, for most people. So the rates of suicide among Native Americans, uh, Caroline mentioned that earlier, but double the national rate. Autistic people have a much higher rate of, of considering suicide. And also, you know, of course, if we want to connect that to oppression, a much higher rate of being alienated or feeling like the society was designed for or can meet their needs. We also see the statistics around gay teens, for example, 8.4 times more likely to attempt suicide, and then trans people. Now, it's 40% in this country, according to our research, that attempt suicide in, in their lifetime, but actually in Australia it's 50%. You know, it's, it's very high in a number of different countries. And I'm not sure if that's because our countries are different, the realities are different, or just the research is a little bit more accurate. I don't know. But the point being, it's, it's really significant. Now, sometimes when we do longer trainings, I'll just sneak this in. I will say we, we refer to the shocking research that's not so shocking that is now increasingly coming out saying in environments where young people's names and pronouns are respected, the suicide rates really drop down to pretty much normal, uh, you know, like what we normally see in other people of the same age. So important point that tells us that it's not just that there's something else wrong with trans people, it's, it's really about the environment and the trauma and the rejection that people are experiencing. Thank you, Sarah. And yeah, I just, I think it might be on your CEU quiz what Sarah just said. So I'm I'm going to restate it because it's not written on the slide, but it is from a study of the Journal of American Medicine that yes, um, we have the first generation of trans youth where there are trans youth whose um, names and pronouns are respected, the ones that fit for them in the gender that they identify with um, rather than the gender that they were assigned. And we now know that when trans people's names and pronouns are respected, uh, that their suicide rate is not any higher than their cisgender, their non-trans non peers. Um, so uh, yeah, a really effective thing that we can do to reduce suicide rates is simply honor people's uh, gender identity um, and have access to, um, you know, trans supports that celebrate trans identity and, um, you know, address the the issues that that community face faces. Um, so I think a lot of people are aware that. Suicide rates in this country have been climbing since the turn of the millennium quite steadily. Now, I want people to know that this is not a global trend. Uh, in most Western, wealthy Western nations, um, suicide rates are not increasing like the U.S. And so a lot of people have tried to figure out why the United States looks quite different than, you know, these, than Britain, say, or Sweden, or um, other nations that have, you know, as many resources. And um, one of the factors that has mapped kind of right on top of our climbing suicide rate is a widening gap in income. So out of wealthy nations, our, our nation has a lot of wealth, 
but that wealth isn't well distributed. So as suicide rates have increased, what we've seen is that the rich have gotten richer, the poor have gotten poorer, and actually suicide rates have increased in both groups. Now you will see, as it says on the slide, that um, poverty and isolation uh, states where there is the highest rate of these things have the highest rates of suicide, and also uh, they have the highest rates of opioid overdose too. That you know sometimes when we're looking at those two statistics, we're not always sure like which um, which one someone falls into, unfortunately, since there's a lot of opioid death. So um, looking at suicide and addressing suicide does mean um, looking broadly. So even if we're not mental health providers, it's everyone's responsibility to shift the suicide rate because you know, the way that we cast our vote, the way that we structure our communities, um, what resources are available in many spheres beyond the mental health world are critical to addressing this issue. So um, one of the, I want to credit uh, the great um, poet and philosopher um, Adrian Marie Brown, who wrote Emergent Strategy, uh, for really coining this term of moving beyond the idea of post-traumatic stress to a present traumatic society. Uh, we can have a lot of great trauma healing modalities out there, but we also need to be looking at the wider social conditions um, that cause the suicide rate to rise. Um, student loan debt, I certainly, living in an area with a lot of expensive colleges, I've supported a lot of folks uh, considering suicide over just staggering debt. Um, Doing simple things like increasing the minimum wage can significantly reduce uh, suicides. Um, certain um, parts of the country, a lot of suicides, well, I mean, in our country, there's, there's a lot of access to guns. Um, and that is correlated. Repealing gun safety measures is, um, you know, clearly uh, correlated with rates of suicide. Um, you can read all about this in the excellent book um, by Jonathan Metzl that just came out, um, Dying by Whiteness. Um, and so, yeah, and then finally, we already said that in industrialized nations, just because we're wealthy nations, it doesn't protect us um, from high suicide if that wealth is um, only concentrated in the hands of a few. So we now have, um, you know, a few decades of solid trauma research, um, as we've seen. And a big question that people often have is, why is it that someone has experienced a trauma and they live a relatively fulfilling life versus someone might have a very similar trauma um, and struggle lifelong with thoughts of suicide or suicide attempts. Uh, what has been implicated over and over um, are two factors, silence and shame. Silence and shame. So if you've had a trauma, and you haven't talked about it to anyone, you are more at risk for suicide. If you have a trauma and you feel like it's your fault, um, you are going to be more at risk as well. And we see this play out in our country with some of the economic stuff. Um, I think in our country, more than others, having wealth is viewed as having virtue, oh, if, if you're wealthy, it means you've worked really hard. And if you're poor, then you're not hardworking. So it's something to be ashamed of. 
I think we all know that's not actually true. I think we all know people that are working 50, 60, 70 hours a week and still struggling to make ends meet. Um, but because of the way our culture um, is structured with sort of the American dream, there can be this additional shame um, with not having financial resources. And that's something to be really important. That's something important for supporters to be aware of. So if you take anything away from this webinar, we hope that you'll be thinking about these factors of silence and shame and how do we address them, but also how do we keep from replicating them, right? Because sometimes I've seen like in the interest of trauma awareness, um, you know, I've been on a unit and someone will be facilitating a group and someone might bring up a life difficulty and that person would say, oh, you can't talk about that here because you might trigger someone. And so what we see is that person gets silent and then they might have shame even develop like, oh my God, if I talk about that experience, then I'm hurting other people. And that's a replicated, honestly, an abuse message, right? Because sometimes people are told you can't talk about you know, the fact that I abused you or bad things will happen. So what we want people is to really keep these factors in mind. Um, you know, talking about trauma in groups is not shown to be, um, you know, something that is harmful. It's, it's something that we really want to encourage um, if we're looking at these factors closely that come up time and time again. So one of the things we just want to name is that a lot of the time there's certain values and fears that get fostered in our systems that are, are related to uh, also control and but they really they really get in the way of us being able to form trauma-informed environments that really support people and make space to talk about some of these pieces. And you know, we, we just want to talk briefly about liability. There's a lot of confusion in this country, but also I've seen it in other countries as well, uh, what, for example, mandated reporter means. And a lot of people believe that if you're a mandated reporter and someone talks about suicide, therefore you are mandated to report that to somebody. And that's just not what mandated reporter means. It does vary from state to state in this country uh, on the whole, but there's, there's two different laws we want to make sure you're looking at. One is the mandated reporter law, which is actually fairly consistent in most places. It basically says if you are aware of abuse or neglect or sus suspect abuse or neglect, of someone who's elderly or considered a child or disabled by a caretaker, then if you're a mandated reporter, you have a mandate to report that. Now, it says nothing about suicide. There are also duty to warn laws that you want to look up with and be familiar with for your state or your country. And those duty to warn laws in a couple of states, not very many though, do mention suicide. If you're aware of suicide, you need to notify someone, or a risk of suicide, you need to notify someone. But actually, in most states, there just isn't a law that dictates what you need to do. Usually it's an organizational policy, and sometimes those organizational policies are guided by really old ways of thinking or based on fear, as the slide says. So, we just encourage you to get the details on that, really learn what it is in your state so that you can advocate potentially for making more space to talk about suicide because people who are talking about suicide are often not the ones who are killing themselves. It's just a really important thing to remember. And so part of what we want to really emphasize with this webinar is that instead of getting so fixated on the if, you know, if someone's going to kill themselves, who, who is it going to be, which group are you in, are you in the high risk, the low risk, what? Instead of focusing on that, we can focus on like why? Why is somebody thinking about that? What's going on in their life? And can we actually support them to get to a place in their life where they want to live rather than we need to watch them and control them? And that's really what we're talking about here. And just one last thought along these similar lines is that sometimes placing people in risk categories can can actually make them feel unheard or really get back into replicating some of the trauma of feeling abandoned and discarded. Now, those risk assessments 
they lack predictive value. They actually don't have a lot of research to back them, and I would encourage you to watch the original webinar that we did with Sean and Caroline to talk more about those assessment uh, tools and how effective they are, which is not very. <laughs> But really just important to remember that even just the act of going through that and then, for example, shuffling someone into the low risk category can leave them feeling just less deserted. Because wherever someone fits according to a risk assessment, they still deserve space to talk and support. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so we're going to talk about a couple other historical developments because we asked that question before, um, when ACE came out um, in the 90s, like why did it not make a bigger impact that, than it did? Um, why do we still see a system that's not really based on getting people's stories, but placing them in categories quite quickly, and then um, you know, prescribing neuroleptics? Well, part of that is simply the trajectory of historical development. So the first neuroleptic drug came about in the 1950s and 1960s. So um, Thorazine um, was the first drug that was utilized in psychiatric units because of the sedating effect that people noticed that it had. Now, um, out of that, uh, you know, in those early days when there weren't a lot of tools, when people kind of saw the brain as like almost just like a piece of meat, they would, our understanding was very unsophisticated, um, people made certain theories. So when it was discovered that um, Thorazine uh, had an effect on dopamine, people thought, oh, okay, so what that means is that people have distress because they have too much dopamine in their brain, um, which kind of makes sense, but it's neither really scientific or sophisticated because, um, you know, for example, uh, if I take an aspirin and it makes my headache go away, that doesn't necessarily mean that my headache was caused by an aspirin imbalance. If I drink coffee um, and it has an effect that I like, it doesn't mean that my fatigue was caused by a caffeine imbalance. Um, maybe eventually over time if you become dependent on it, which you know people can de become dependent on these drugs as well, um, but initially your fatigue was probably caused by factors in your environment not the lack of a chemical. So in the 50s and 60s, we had these very simplistic um, theories coming about. A lot of them were ultimately disproven um, as our understanding of the brain becomes more sophisticated um, and new data is emerging all the time. However, in the United States, where pharmaceutical companies, for example, are allowed to advertise direct to consumer and where corporations have incredible power to drive the narrative. This paradigm, uh, this uh, system based around quickly providing a neuroleptic and a 15 minute med check and sending people on their way, it still very much exists. Now, globally, uh, this is recognized as um, a significant um, issue that, needs, that we need to begin to make a paradigm shift around. In the United States, for example, um, folks like myself um, who are diagnosed bipolar or schizophrenic um, have a life expectancy um, that is 25 years less than people without those diagnoses. Or it used to be, um, because recent studies indicate that morbidity gap is actually growing. Um, so it's something like 26 and a half years now. And so when we look at information like that, when we see other areas of medicine uh, 
people are living longer, for example, with HIV or with cancer. But in this area of you know, psychiatric conditions, people are dying even younger. Then we have to look, as the United Nations urges, um, at shifting the paradigm. Um, so uh, instead of focusing so much on chemical imbalance, the UN urges us to address power imbalances. And of course, trauma is usually on the other end of an extreme power imbalance. And we can see power imbalances play out uh, in the system as well. So what we're going to do now is really quickly um, look at some of the ways that we have learned that trauma manifests in us physically. And then we're going to ask, um, what is it, what is there out there to address um, this manifestation of trauma? Um, and is there an evidence-based pharmaceutical intervention to actually um, you know, target some of these struggles that people have? So the first one that we're looking at is the fact that trauma can decrease communication between the left and right hemisphere of the brain. Uh, it can make it harder for us to um, take trauma memories and um, integrate them into the long term. So trauma memories can stay very present. It can make it harder for us to move through big emotional states. All of these things rely on sort of intrahemisphere communication. So our question is, if that's the way that trauma manifests, is there a pill that can increase that? Um, the answer is no. There is nothing that targeted or um, that can perform that particular function in a pharmaceutical um, intervention. However, there are tons of things that we hope people on this webinar will go and learn more about that can be incredibly healing ways to reestablish that lost communication. Um, our minds are incredibly plastic um, and have the ability to heal. Um, when um, looking at some of these practices like tapping, EFT, um, it's based on energy meridians and is designed um, to uh, move emotions through both hemispheres of the brain um, and has great results. EMDR, there may be some EMDR practitioners here, um, a way to process trauma where using a finger, the facilitator will engage the different hemispheres of the brain. That's what they are physically doing through the eye saccades, the eye movement, um, and eye movement desensitization response. Um, and these wonderful effects can also come um, from healing practices like communal rhythms. So there's a lot of studies about singing in groups and drumming in groups being affected as well as martial arts. And so the next thing we're going to look at, um, something that is very common to trauma survivors, sometimes people feel like they've lost the ability um, to speak or articulate. Um, and often that is the result of a deactivation of a particular area of our brains. And um, we're going to ask the question, um, is there a pharmaceutical intervention that can target Broca's area very specifically and help heal that deactivation from trauma? So, no, <laughs> is, is the answer to that question. But there are a number of approaches, some of them clinical, some of them not, that can. So I'm not going to go through all of these 
in, in super depth, but I do want to mention internal family systems is an approach that perhaps some of you are familiar with that regards each of us as having different parts, basically. Perhaps we have a child part that is holding fear. We have maybe a protector part. And it, it's a sort of approach that, that really encourages talking to those different parts and, and getting their take and, and supporting them to move through whatever's going on. So that's just like a really, really like at the surface description of that. We also see things like expressive arts and movement really helping people to move through trauma. For example, there's research in inner cities with young people who have experienced a lot of trauma where even if they are, for example, performing Shakespeare that is full of emotion, but it's not their own emotion, just the act of doing that in this really expressive way and moving and, and speaking someone else's emotion can help them process some of their own, but you know, there's many other different directions we could come at the arts and, and movement. Um, uh, intentional peer support is a, an approach that was started by Sherry Me that is very much trauma-informed. It's really about being present with people and creating space for them. Voice dialogue is, is something that comes out of the hearing voices movement. We do a lot of hearing voices training, and so this is really about doing what a lot of clinical systems have told people not to do, which is to engage in conversations with your voices, either with support on your own, and, and just really looking to make meaning of these experiences. But wherever all of this lands, so much of what is most important in all of this is the relationships people have with their supporters, whatever approach is being used. That tends to be the strongest predictor of how effective it is going to be. Thanks, Sarah. I was just um, responding to stuff in the chat. Yes, it's a really great question about um, drumming in school. Um, certainly, we do not, people who are interested in trauma-informed approaches and interested in reducing suicide rates should be sure to advocate for keep, keep, keeping the arts in school. Um, Sarah just shared the study about um, the performing arts and plays, um, but uh, choir, uh, music, these are all um, incredibly effective um, modalities to help people express and move through um, emotions and trauma. Um, so, and also, uh, someone had a question about Broca's area. Broca's area is widely understood um, to be a part of our brain that's critical in articulating speech. Um, so the last thing that we are going to look at, we're talking about the plasticity um, of the brain. So if I'm constantly in an environment where I'm being traumatized or scared, you know, what happens, neuroscience 101 is neurons that fire together wire together. So um, if I'm in an environment where I'm constantly under threat, my brain will wire to be constantly vigilant, um, activated. I will lose potentially sleep and constantly be locked into this um, phase of like running from a tiger in the jungle. So um, I'm someone that does a lot of neurofeedback for my trauma. And, um, you know, when my brain waves are on the screen, uh, especially when I first started, um, you know, it did not look like someone who was just sitting in a room with a kindly woman, um, a kindly RN that knows neurofeedback. It looked like someone who was ready to fight for their life. And that, that's what a lot of folks who are traumatized are working with. Now, we do see people using a lot of pharmaceutical interventions for this, right? You see a lot of uh, sorry, prescriptions, for example, of antidopaminergic drugs or benzodiazepines. Um, but ultimately, um, it has not been shown that these interventions have good long-term efficacy. Uh, these interventions can often, you might have to take more and more to get the same effect. Um, I know it happened to me. I had a grand mal seizure um, from benzodiazepine withdrawal 
because I was just taking so much. And so that was really scary. So I needed to find something that was going to give me long-term results without a lot of side effects. And those um, methods are available. So um, yoga, breathing techniques, you know, sometimes these things are looked at as like alternatives, um, but they have been used very successfully for thousands and thousands of years. And empirical studies are just now catching on to the effectiveness of some of these things. Um, yeah, someone's also mentioning um, bioral beats, um, different frequencies in music. Um, and so neurofeedback um, is simply a way to be able to get immediate feedback about what your brain waves are doing. And if your brain calms down, at least in my case when I'm doing it, when it calms down, I get rewarded by seeing a Pac-Man move through a maze. And so I have gotten, neurofeedback has been life-changing for me um, in my ability to talk to you all and not feel terrified right now that I'm talking into a void to 188 people. Like, that scares me. Um, but neurofeedback has been helpful for just strengthening the part of my brain that steps in and calms that scared part and says, it's going to be OK. These are 188 folks that want to change the world, and it's going to be all right. So we do just want to say, you know, we, we've spent some time here talking about what psychiatric drugs are not really able to do, but we do just want to say we're not saying psychiatric drugs are a useless tool, get them out of here, make them illegal. That's not what we're saying. What we are saying is that they can be a tool, but they're just one of many tools that are available. And what we're really looking for is to support people to make informed choices and not to elevate or push certain tools over others, particularly in the rea when there's a certain reality that we don't really know how a lot of the psychiatric drugs work for a lot of people or for whom they're going to work. You know, there's a lot of information that's out there that gets misconstrued. For example, people have talked for years about, oh, there's brain scan research that tells us that certain brains are different and that's why we need to treat them with these particular drugs, but actually, if you look at the whole body of research, for example, there's research out there that says that taxi drivers in New York City, that their brains have differences in them as well. And unless we want to believe that there are certain people whose brains are predestined to them becoming taxi drivers in New York, then we have to begin to understand that sometimes what those scans are showing us are the impact of what people are doing in their life. Certainly our brains are, are completely uh, connected to everything that's happening to and around us. So we need to bear that in mind and not operate in these assumptions that everyone needs to be using the same approach, including psychiatric drugs. That said, even some of the most progressive research out there says that about 15 to 20 percent of people who end up uh, taking psychiatric drugs at some point in their life end up actually doing better when they see them on them for longer. And we don't know why. And we don't know if there are conditions that would shift that in one direction or another. But we know it's true. So just for your awareness, we wanted to put that out there. Thank you, Sarah. And so, yeah, what we, what we are advocating for, you know, trauma-informed approaches around suicide or around anything else should include choice. Um, so much of, you know, when I'm speaking to someone who's suicidal or if I felt that way myself, it's because I felt completely out of options. Um, so we want to make sure that there are, you know, different options presented for folks for whom um, drugs have not worked or for whom drugs have stopped working. So um, we're coming, we've got about 20 minutes left. Um, we do want to come back to the realm of personal story, too. Um, this isn't a trauma-informed world. It's not one where everything has to have, like, an IRB-reviewed research study behind it. 
a trauma-informed one is where we listen deeply to trauma survivors um, and support them to make those connections in their life. Um, so for me, um, I love being in this diverse group of people. I think there's at least one Hoosier in this 188 uh, folks, um, and a Hoosier is what I am. I don't know if everyone knows what that word means. Um, but uh, I am someone that was born in the state of mm -hmm. Indiana. And um, so Indiana is different culturally than Western Mass. And being trauma-informed means um, looking at the wider culture and cultural messaging. So some of the cultural messaging I got in Indiana um, is that you don't it's not encouraged to have big feelings or talk about feelings. Um, the things people talked about were things like the weather or sales at Walmart. Um, it was also a place where, you know, you didn't talk about unpleasant things and you didn't question authority. And so for me, some of the issues with that culturally came around my trauma because a lot of my trauma as a child happened from people who were in authority roles. Um, now that I'm older, like I understand that those things were abuse, um, emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, et cetera. But at the time, it was framed as punishment. So I kept really silent about it, and I was often ashamed of it. Um, and so when I started to hear voices that other people didn't hear, that was not the biggest issue in my life. In fact, some of those voices um, felt like they were the only protectors that I have. Um, and I think like a lot of folks, you know, that start hearing voices, it can be um, quite neutral at first. It can be something of a warning that there's pain in your life that needs to be healed. Um, but in my case, that pain was not addressed. And so that experience got more and more extreme. Um, so I was about eight years old. Um, I think I'm a little, little older than I am in this picture. I'm the one, of course, in the leather jacket um, that I was taken to, you know, my first psychiatrist. And um, you know, what was going on at that time, I was hearing voices, but the most stressful part was that the United States had just entered into the first American Gulf War. And, you know, I was terrified that, you know, people were going to die. And bombs, I could see the bombs falling on TV, and I thought, you know, everyone was going to die. And so when the adults told me that they could get me some help, I was really relieved because what I thought they meant was, you know, someone was going to help me stop the war and help me um, from keeping kids, like my two little sisters that you see there in the photo, keep them from getting hurt. Um, but what actually happened was help meant a psychiatrist. Um, and psychiatrists, um, you know, aren't aren't involved in, in social change um, or in wars, but they can certainly, you know, what they do have is a prescription pad, and they certainly made use of it for me. Um, so I was prescribed quite a few neuroleptics, um, you know, continued, those dosages continued to climb as I grew older, along with side effects like violent shaking um, and being one of the heavier kids in the class. Um, and experienced bullying and trauma because of that. So I want to name some of that and also the fact, um, I also want to name just kind of like growing up as a woman, um, it felt like every passing year there was a new thing I was supposed to be ashamed of, like a new part of my body that I was supposed to be ashamed of, like hair on my legs or having a period or, you know, um, you know, your hair uh, on your head had to be, 
you know, just right. It couldn't be, like, too flat, and it couldn't be too curly. And just all, like, the pressure. Like, you should be ashamed for being angry, or you should be ashamed for talking too much or talking too little. It was, like, an unwinnable game, um, it seemed. So for me, you know, my thoughts of suicide as a young person, a lot of them were thoughts of comfort. You know, I looked at that big bottle of Seroquel and I thought, you know, I can't figure, I can't win this game. Every day I'm bullied. Um, you know, my voices had turned quite bullying, reflecting the bullying in my environment. You know, maybe uh, I could just choose not to do this anymore instead of playing the game to drop out of the game. And that kind of made me feel like I had a choice. Um, so I, I want to be explicit about that, um, that my first thoughts of suicide were actually kind of a comfort <laughs> based on what I was dealing with around me. Um, and it felt like a viable solution. And it felt like I could get up and go to school because if I wanted to, if I wanted to, I could just end things. Um, but I also learned, you know, if that's your strategy, and it was one I was proud of, don't share it um, to, well, most mental health providers because then they freak out and instead of just being on a ton of neuroleptics, you find yourself contained um, in a psych ward, on a plastic mattress, on 15-minute check with the guy with the flashlight every 15 minutes. Um, so it felt like at the time that I was very isolated and like a lot of trauma survivors, I thought I was sort of like this uniquely messed up person. Um, you know, I was told that I was mentally ill, that I was borderline, that I had this genetic disease. And so there wasn't a lot of space for me to kind of share like some of these um, stories and questions. Um, I learned to keep silent. Um, so what changed for me because you know, um, I'm in a pretty different place now. I'm not currently institutionalized. I don't currently live in a group home. Um, so I named neurofeedback as being really helpful. But I think what for me was most important was finding a healing community, um, a place where I could have a purpose and a role, um, where I could sort of let go of this identity of being sick or broken and develop kind of other strengths. I needed a community with a different value system. And so I was very lucky um, to live in a group home where one of the group home staff was a huge fan of roller derby. Um, and uh, this group home staff was a really good guy. And um, instead of thinking, okay, these people just need to stay safe and sober, and it's fine if they just sit on the porch and smoke cigarettes. He really encouraged us to get involved in the wider world. And I remember the first roller derby game he took me to. It was actually 12 years ago this week, according to Facebook. Um, my voices that I heard in my head were kind of struck dumb. Some of the voices that said, you know, who do you think you are, Missy? Be quiet, Missy. You're dirty, Missy, um, that echoed my past trauma. When they saw the women on that track um, and how strong and powerful they were, um, they were completely struck dumb. And so being a part of that community, being welcomed into that community, I got to move a lot of trauma through my body but I got to also talk to women um, that were exceedingly strong and learn that they too had struggled in their life, that they too had struggled with some of the messages, that they too had been sexually assaulted. Um, and they really welcomed me. And instead of this identity of bipolar borderline personality disorder, um, I was given a new name um, by, a uh, by a skater uh, named Scariot Tubman. Her number was 40 plus one for 40 acres and a mule. Um, she, you know, was a very 
uh, amazing blocker, a uh, powerful black woman from uh, the Columbia Quad Squad. And um, she helped me create a name that acknowledged my identity, um, an identity I had other than a painful one. Um, and she helped me come up with the name Mazel Tov Cocktail, uh, number 18, faster than a spinning dreidel. Um, and so it was in community. I really want to emphasize it was not. It was not in the psych ward. It was not. I'll be honest. For me, it was not in DBT. Um, you know, though I respect Marsha Linehan. Um, you know, when I've talked to her, her spiritual journey is really powerful to hear. And I'm also someone that is on a spiritual journey and has found healing in that. Um, but it was something quite different. And so what I want to close by saying is when we're supporting people, even if they're folks that have been hospitalized in group homes for many, many years um, and are indicated as high risk, to think outside the box, to think about where in a community someone might connect. Um, and it might you know, I love the peer community of which I'm a part of and at work in, but it could be something else. Um, it could be a spiritual community, an LGBTQ community, an advocacy group, making music for people. Um, so there is no empirical study on roller derby showing it reduces rates of suicide or heals trauma. but. You know, for me, it did. And so it's valuable and important um, to name. Thanks, Caroline, for sharing. So we just have a few more slides we want to get through with you. I know we don't have a lot of time. So I just want to offer, really, a lot of this is also referring back to, if you, if you go watch that webinar with Sean and Caroline, you'll get more on these last few slides. But we just really want to emphasize this idea of in community. And of course, one of the main interventions in our society, many, in several countries really, is when someone talks about suicide, what we do with them is we put them in, in the hospital. You heard that also in my story, and we see it all around us. But the reality that we want you to be aware of is that actually psychiatric hospitalization is not especially effective when someone is struggling with thoughts of suicide or has made a suicide attempt. And in fact, You'll see this meta-analysis uh, outcome on your screen here, but there's actually studies at this point that are saying that hospitalization actually raises for many people the risk of suicide. What this one found that's really important is that not even uh, while someone's hospitalized or, or just after they've been released is, is the rate quite high, but for years after, people's suicide risk has become elevated after they're in a psychiatric hospitalization. Another point I'll just add to that is that that's true even for people who entered a psychiatric facility for a reason other than being suicidal. So they found something around like at least for a year after suicide rates are remain elevated for people who entered for a different reason. And it's even longer for people who entered because of suicidal thoughts or attempts. And to me, that really speaks to, again, this idea of loss of control and loss of power that can happen in so many of these institutions and people really needing something other than that in order to move through these, through these dark places. So one of the things, of course, is you know within community, we talk a lot in the alternative suicide approach, how can we connect people to a community, whatever that might mean for them, so that they have a reason to want to be here for themselves see a lot of different questions that we sometimes ask when we're having that conversation with people. And one of them is, are there things you want to do before your life ends? I have a whole article I wrote on that in America. If you want to check it out, you can find a bunch of articles I wrote there. And one of them talks about this man that I really supported for a long time who is now passed away but not a suicide. Uh, unfortunately, he, he ended up having a heart attack and a stroke and ended up passing away. But we went through this whole process, and one of the – changes in our relationship was when I asked him, I hear that you want to die, but is there anything you want to do before you die? It meant my putting down my agenda, but it also made him 
be able to have the space to really think about what are the things that bring joy to his life. And by the end of that conversation, which ended up extending over the course of a couple of weeks, he had gotten back in touch with his own spark for wanting to be in this world. And we just can't do that if all we're focused on is control and power over and how to prevent constantly. We really miss the mark sometimes when we get too lost and all that. So really part of what we're wanting to leave you with is how can we act as a bridge rather than a life raft. It's not about being a savior or thinking that we are the one who's going to make the, all the difference in someone's life. It's really how do we bridge people to a life that they want to live. You're still muted, Caroline. I think you're still muted. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. We're going to turn it over to Katie really quickly here. Um, this slide um, that you see is from the Alternatives to Suicide Overview webinar. Um, we just want to give it to you as a taste for those who haven't had a chance yet of what that webinar will cover that this one um, only kind of touched on. And, and yeah, Hi, everybody. Animals. Animals are amazing healers. Thank you for talking about uh, animals. They just know. Yes, indeed. Well, I just want to, in the last couple of minutes we have here, just thank Sarah and Caroline both um, for sharing so much good information and so much of your personal journey. It just, uh, um, it's always powerful to hear you hear you both speak, and it's energizing. Um, which I think is very hard to do on a webcast focused on suicide and trauma, but I feel energized, and I'm hoping that our participants do as well. And thank you to all of you who have been sharing in the chat box. It, it also enriches our conversation. Um, so I put the MHTTC website in the chat box here, and if you go there and click on the calendar, you can search and you'll find the archive of the webcast um, that was a week or two weeks ago on the alternatives to suicide approach. I think we'll also be able to send that out in a follow-up email, but I need to check on that. Um, so uh, a couple of things. If you've got questions, uh, you can reach out to us at the MHTTC network email. You can also reach out to Sarah and Caroline specifically. Um, if you can't remember any of that and you reach out to one of us and are looking for the other of us, we talk. <laughs> and so we'll be able to connect you. Uh, Please do pay attention for the evaluation email that will come in the next 24 hours or so. And if you want continuing education, make sure you fill that out because we're not able to give continuing ed credit unless, that, um, unless you fill out this form that you'll get in that follow-up email. Um, so that's everything. Uh, if you have any questions, we can hang out for three-ish more minutes. Uh, and again, thank you just so much. Um, for your presentation. Yeah, I'll just add to the animal piece. Um, mm -hmm. I'm someone that also, I couldn't include this in, in that very short version of my story, but I'm someone that also had the opportunity to live on a therapeutic farm for a while. Um, and working to work with um, animals, that was my role. And um, it was incredibly valuable. Um, and I would love to see that become more accessible because a lot of those programs are really costly. Um, and to me, it's just like so weird because my ancestors, you know, 100 years ago or 150 years ago, that's what they did they raised sheep and um, you know a return to that like being able to do that now is like considered a privilege um, but for a lot of folks having that time um, and and that purpose and that relationship with an animal um, can transform their life. Well, I think this concludes our webcast. Be well, everyone, and uh, we look forward to connecting.